Following the recent release of Book 6, we have just one last season of The Dragon Prince coming, assuming that it doesn't get renewed for the new seasons they had planned that were revealed at Comic-Con. But today, we're going to talk about the ending of Book 6 and what theories that leaves us for what will happen in the 7th season, which, even if it does get renewed again, is going to be the end of this particular saga. My name is Timeline Elfka, and I promise not to use my powers to spoil the end of Season 7, no matter how cool the theory sounds. But make sure you hit that subscribe button so that when Season 7 does come out, you don't miss our videos breaking it down. Now, the structure of the show thus far has been that each season or volume is referred to as a book, with each being named after one of the primal sources. There are only six primal sources, however, and that includes the stars, which are a kind of special sixth element already that very few creatures in Zadia tap into. While each book tended to focus on a new type of elf and a new type of primal that they were associated with, there was very little that was able to be explored in Book 6, as the star-touched elves need to remain a bit more mysterious for Book 7. Instead, the Celestial Elves, which are really just Skywing Elves, were created to be the Elven focus this season, with the Star-Touched Elves getting a few scenes focused around Erevos and even their little council, but with most of their story seeming to come out in the next season. It seemed obvious to a lot of fans, even before it was revealed at the recent Comic-Con panel then, that Book 7 would be titled Dark, and be focused around dark magic. And with there being no dark magic elves, and Erevos finally making it out of his prison, the focus will be a lot more on the star elves, I believe. Now, dark magic as a theme makes sense because we don't understand all of its intricacies. At the end of the day, darkness is not some primal source like the moon, sun, ocean, or what have you, but instead, dark magic is just a term used to describe tapping into those primal sources by using living creatures that have a natural connection to it themselves. However, doing this, according to Cosmo, leaves a hole in your soul that other entities like Erevos are somehow able to control you through. Callum, in particular, was said to have nothing but darkness, virtually no hope for redemption. But he's done relatively little dark magic compared to Claudia and Viren, who spent their whole lives dedicated to it at this point. Right now, we don't know why Erevos is able to control people through dark magic, as he isn't some sort of dark magic elf. He's just a star-touched elf, and it's hard to say why he should have this connection to dark magic. Maybe Erevos himself using dark magic has made him the master of the dark network that it creates in an entity's soul. But regardless of what the answer is, Season 7 will undoubtedly reveal it to us. This season, then, I expect to explore essentially the science behind dark magic and reveal to us Erevos' final plan to use it to manipulate the humans. Now, like with every season before, the final season will likely have nine episodes, divided into three different plots of three episodes each. This has been the structure used since season one, with each season basically being made up of three hour and a half long movies. There's no way to narrow down an exact idea of what each of these three episode arcs will be, but the first will likely involve the immediate problem of Erevos. Erevos ended book six by not just escaping his prison, but having something of a titan form, but I don't think his plan is done quite yet. Getting caught and thrown into prison seemed to be part of his plan in many ways, and escaping his prison just allows Erevos to continue to manipulate people more directly, instead of just doing it from beyond physical reach. While some might want to imagine a huge epic battle immediately taking place and just lasting all of nine episodes, I don't think that will be the case. After Erevos establishes some sort of hostile new normal, or perhaps even retreats from Catullus, Callum and the others are going to realize they need to find a way to defeat Erevos with the help of the other star-touched elves. Perhaps the key to this will be Claudia. Right now, she seems like she will be Erevos' faithful servant, but at some point she could even accidentally reveal the information of Leola to the others. She could be arguing that Erevos is a good person who doesn't deserve to die, who ultimately has good plans for them, and cite his dead daughter as proof that he loves and experiences emotions the way that the humans do, and that he connects to Claudia specifically because of that. In hearing this, Callum, Rayla, and Ezrin could realize that there is a way to permanently kill Erebos the way Leola died, but that they would have to seek the help of the star-touched elves and their council. This would lead to the middle three episodes, which after some travel can take place in a new location and interacting with a new character or elf species, or as I personally theorize with this season, the elf known as the Merciful One. Each season, as I said, tends to give us insight into a new group of elves, and this could be a three-episode journey similar to what we saw with the Celestial Elves in Volume 6, where the Dragon Prince kids end up interacting with the star-touched elves across three episodes, getting sucked into some story to help them in order to get help in return. 
While the Merciful One would likely get the most screen time here, we could end up learning about all of the other star-touched elves, as they may not be that numerous. Each star-touched elf is known to come from a constellation of stars, and they exist in the heavens until those stars align properly over Zadia, where they can finally take on physical form. According to the Celestial Elves, Erevos would only have to wait a few short years to return to Zadia if his body alone was destroyed, still existing among the stars until they align again. Because of this, I imagine these star touched elves to be like the dragons, very few in number, with these star touched elves said to be the only entities known to live even longer than the dragons. Because of this, they understand these smaller creatures of Zadia with their shorter lifespans based on the patterns that these creatures generally follow over their lifetimes. Their short lives allow them all to have the same basic patterns because they don't have the time to understand the consequences of decisions until much later in life when they are nearing death. The star-touched elves continue to live long past that, and certain star-touched elves, like Erebos, know how to manipulate humans effectively because he can trust them not to be suspicious as long as he plays his part in a certain way that other humans have reacted to similarly. The most obvious example of this is with Claudia, where Erebos used his own story of Leola in order to make Claudia feel bad for him. She was already working towards freeing him from his prison, but with Terry there to cast doubt on the plan, Erevos' story is what makes Claudia feel all the pain and loss of her father again, convincing her to make sure Erevos should be helped for trying to help her with her own father. Because of this, the other star-touched elves have a very detached mindset, seeing only what they think of as the ultimate good, and likely being unwilling to help the humans. After the corruption of the humans by Leola, the star-touched elves seem to have taken an increasingly distant role in Zadia, being very rare following the imprisonment of Erebos it would seem. If Callum and the others made it to the star-touched elves and asked them to destroy Erebos like they did Leola, I wouldn't be surprised if they simply said no. Despite how happy they were to do this to Leola after teaching some magic to humans, they may see Erebos continuing to corrupt them as not really making the problem any worse, at least not so worse that he should be removed. It's hard to say what they think the end of this will be, and they did go through a lot of trouble to imprison him it would seem, but like with the humans being banished to the west, instead of being annihilated entirely, the merciful one, as they are called, may still just believe that there is a better option out there for Erebos than simply ending his existence. Perhaps with that, we will also get some sort of explanation for why they were so harsh with Leola for her more simple mistake, and not with Erebos for his more direct manipulations of Zadia, but how exactly that will pan out is definitely still a mystery to me. With no hope from the star-touched elves, I imagine the final part of the plot will involve trying to find the Nova Blade. This is the sword that Callum and Rayla went to the Celestial Elves to find, with the hope that it could defeat Erevos. As the Elder explained, however, this would only lead to Erevos coming back in a few years. At some point, Callum and the others may realize that the temporary defeat of Erevos is better than nothing, and at the very least, they can keep using the Nova Blade to defeat him every few years until they can imprison him again or find some other way to stop him. However, as the Elder said, the Nova Blade was given to a human girl from a long time ago. I have to imagine that if the Nova Blade was given to a human, it was this one. Perhaps being used to stop a rebellious star elf in the past who simply wanted to annihilate the humans, despite the merciful compromise, as it's called in the books, that allowed the humans to live in the West. The Orphan Queen likely sought this from the Celestial Elves who may have had a prophecy that she would come to them for help one day, the same way they had a prophecy about Callum the Human and Rayla the Elf. This would be an epic thing to be explored in the actual Orphan Queen series if that ever gets made, but with all this set up, I can't imagine the Nova Blade won't come back in the final season in some way. If the Orphan Queen did have it, then it would be hidden somewhere around the castle of Catullus, perhaps, and it would be really interesting for Ezrin to find a secret room like he did back in the first season, this time containing the lost Nova Blade that no one in the castle knew the true power of. As we said, this would not be a permanent solution, however, and while I do imagine this weapon would make its way into the story, I don't think it would be the ultimate conclusion to this saga. The real conclusion, I imagine, won't come from our characters, but from Erebos himself, as he reveals his grand master plan. As a master manipulator, Aaron Ehaz and Justin Richmond related his mystery to being about whether or not Erebos is Luciferian or Promethean. Here's what they had to say. I mean, you've heard us talk about Erebos before, so you know we've talked about this like, is he Lucifer or Prometheus, right? His relationship with, you know, yeah. humanity and the gifts and sharing that he has had historically have, have been, you know, inter you can interpret it different ways. Yeah. 
Now, for those who don't know, Lucifer and Prometheus are somewhat related figures in different mythologies. Around the world, we have what we call today the Luciferian tradition, which is the idea that many of the world's ancient cultures have a mythological entity that is associated with the giving of great wisdom, coming at the price of the Luciferian figure himself, the humans, or both. Lucifer is the name commonly used by Christians to refer to a rebellious figure often associated with Satan, a fallen angel that is misleading humanity. It is a name used by Christians for the leader of the fallen angels, or the sons of God as they are called, described in the book of Genesis and the book of Enoch. In Enoch, these figures are explained as giving humans forbidden knowledge that corrupted humanity, essentially the same story of the serpent corrupting Eve with the fruit of forbidden knowledge. The Greeks, however, associated the serpent with their god, Prometheus. The story of Prometheus, as far as we know, predates the writing of the Garden of Eden with the serpent by at least a couple hundred years, with the Eden narrative appearing to be post-Babylonian, and Prometheus dating back to the writings of Hesiod in the 8th century BC, and likely even before. Prometheus was not seen as an evil god, but something more of a noble trickster. His name Prometheus means forethought, and everything he did was with the knowledge that it would one day work out in his favor, though it wasn't always clear if that was for the greater good. Prometheus seemed to want to cause pain for the other gods, but along the way, he also developed a love for his own creations, the humans. Zeus, however, was the ruler of the gods and refused to give humans the gift of unwearing fire, and so Prometheus stole this to give to the humans. Zeus is angered by this and chains Prometheus to the earth, giving him a cyclical torment of having his liver eaten every day by an eagle, which regrows painfully overnight. Prometheus, however, did this with the knowledge that Zeus himself would forgive Prometheus because of the help he had given him in the fight against their parents, the Titans, and that one day Zeus would send a savior descended from Zeus himself to set Prometheus free. This is a similar fate to the fallen angels of the Book of Enoch, however, this Luciferian figure in Judaism was seen as an ultimately evil force, and one who would not be forgiven, but instead would be forced to live inside of the earth or face total annihilation. Erevos and Leola both embody elements of Lucifer Lucifer and Prometheus. Erevos himself seemed to be a more pure entity before the death of his daughter, enjoying physical existence for the same reasons Leola did. Whereas other star-touched elves appear to be detached from Zadia, Erevos and Leola love to interact with all of its inhabitants, including humans, and Erevos liked to study all aspects of its magic, not just the natural magic he has from the stars, either. More than anything, however, he loved spending time with his daughter, greater than solving any mystery of the universe, he said, and what he loved about his daughter was how compassionate she was. Leola giving magic to the humans made the star-touched elf council decide that she had to die. While Erevos claimed it was just a few petty tricks, Erevos' later writings that we can find in the book claim it wasn't a unicorn, but rather the unicorns who gave magic to the humans because of their compassion. He describes them as being the ultimate empathetic creatures of Zadia, with Leola of course being nicknamed Unicorn because of her one horn, but these writings on unicorns seeming to be his attempt to tell her story through this metaphor. However, just because Leola was compassionate to humans doesn't mean she knew it would lead to an ultimate good. She certainly didn't seem to think it would lead to her own demise, or rather, that was something she did not understand, as her cries of terror seemed pretty genuine. It's not that she couldn't have seen a glimpse of some perfect future thanks to giving this gift, but I think the true person aiming for this goal would be none other than Erevos. Erevos currently seems Promethean only in that he has the gift of foresight and can see how things might end up, not doing something for the greater good yet. Instead, his plan seems motivated entirely by revenge, wanting to make figures like Sol Regum suffer and die for their part in killing Leola. According to the star-touched elves, Erevos had seen the same thing that the others had, perhaps referring to the future or something that had happened in the past. But either way, it painted the act of Leola giving humans a simple magic trick as the beginning of the spiral into absolute chaos. Erevos knew his daughter to be loving, especially towards humans. So is it possible that he may actually end up proving to be the ultimate good that in many ways undoes the damage that his daughter had done before? And could that outcome perhaps be some small glimpse that maybe Leola could have known when she first taught a human magic, something she saw as eventually happening despite not understanding the price and chaos that would come with it? Leola's action alone seemed to start the corruption of humans, who grew tired of trying to connect with the primals and wanted to use dark magic as an evil shortcut. Everything Erevos did since then, such as giving Zard his staff and helping Viren, seems to have been to make things even worse, but what if that is not the case? What if Erevos, as someone more attached to the Earth and having empathy, especially through his daughter, could see just a little bit beyond what the star-touched elves could see? 
like Cosmo, he may have navigated timelines where doing things that hurt people lead to better outcomes for the large majority of Zadia. Perhaps he navigated so many timelines that he found one where unicorns nearly went extinct, humans were nearly annihilated before being banished to the west, and Viren would present himself to be an ultimate sacrifice for humanity. It was through Viren and now Claudia that Erevos hopes to achieve whatever his plans are, and whether good or evil, this was the timeline he was navigating to in order to use Claudia. Whether this is to bring back his daughter, destroy Zadia, or become its redemption is hard to say, but if it's the latter, maybe Erevos will bring about an age where humans no longer need dark magic. While Claudia and Viren are these great victims in this story, it did lead Callum alone to learning how to conquer the other primal forces, not needing any special primal stone or anything in order to do the magic. This is rare, but this rare case can evolve into being the majority or totality of humans over enough generations. Humans as a whole could have been developing a closer connection to magic before the dark magic threw people off that path, and it was this particular timeline that led to Callum realizing that he had this power dormant in him, something that elsewise he may have never been able to rediscover as part of humans' natural abilities. Uh, finally, there is the question of the Quasar Diamonds. Erevos used one to escape his prison, and Rayleigh used one to help Runan, but that leaves one more. The final season undoubtedly has to use these in some way, but how that will pan out is hard to say. While Prometheus himself does not have a child who dies and is reborn, it's been argued that Odin is a very similar character, sharing the same root story as Prometheus, and is considered part of the Luciferian tradition. Odin had the gift of foresight and was able to give that up in order to see a distant future where he passes away entirely, but that his son Baldur, who is tragically killed by another god, is able to be revived from the dead to rule the new world. There is a lot of this dying and rebirth narrative in the Luciferian tradition around the world, and even in Judaism there is the story of Messiah ben Yosef or Messiah ben Ephraim, who is said to die for three days and rise from the dead in the Jewish Zohar. It's important to remember that quasar diamonds are made of stardust, and as the Merciful One says at the beginning of Book 6, all beings are stardust held together by love for just an instant. Could this quasar diamond thus be used to bring back Leola, using stardust to make her form her body again, and perhaps make her the true empathetic ruler of the stars, the way that Ezrin managed to become the young empathetic ruler of Catullus? What do you guys think? There are so many ways Season 7 could go, especially as the final season, so let me know your thoughts in the comments, or if you'd like to conversate about them at length, join our Cartoon Universe Discord server. There, we have multiple chats for all of your favorite cartoons, just make sure to ask for the Dragon Prince role when you arrive. See you guys next time!